So welcome along to another episode of the iPhotography podcast. And today we've got something a little bit different. I say we're telling tales today, aren't we, Rebecca? <laughs> not lies, though. <laughs> no, not lies. No, no. These are, I, I think they're pretty fairly truthful. We've we've researched them enough to hopefully know that everything we're going to tell you is, uh, is factual. But um, these are some iconic photos um, that you may have seen, you may never have seen at all. Um, and we want to kind of give you a little bit of the backstory about them, some interesting facts about uh, five uh, famous portrait photos um, that, that we've kind of uh, got. And now this is taken from a, a blog that we wrote kind of quite a while ago about iconic portraits. Um, so this is kind of part one. And what we're hoping to do like another part, maybe some more after that, kind of discussing more images, really. So it's focusing a little bit more on, on famous photographs and giving you a little bit more interesting hopefully stories and insights and yeah. fast facts about them um but if you if you haven't got a clue obviously what we're talking about in terms of um the the topic here about the actual images themselves because obviously as a podcast you won't necessarily see it but if you're watching this on youtube you will um we'll put the description in the link to the blog so if you wanted to actually listen along to this while having a look at the photos you you can do so you'll you'll get the grips of it really but um have you, have you got a favorite photograph, Rebecca, a favorite portrait that you've, you know, something you would love to have on a wall as a print? Um, I have favorites, but not ones I'd like to have as a print. Um, <laughs> now, it makes me wonder now, what would you love but not have on your wall? <laughs> well, one of them is in this, this group of five that we're going to talk about today. Ah. Um, and we all get that. So I, I like them because they're iconic, not necessarily because they are... Um, photogenic <laughs> not, not pretty and necessarily yeah. something you want to I think I may know where you're going with that one yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah I think it's as I say it's 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 tricky to kind of maybe know what makes an image uh iconic and I suppose necessarily it doesn't become iconic until maybe years later does it you know mm -hmm. some of yeah. the ones we're going to talk about later anyway that they, they weren't really you know thought of much at the time but retrospectively have become kind of very notable uh, uh, and kind of as I say iconic very famous really but um should we start off anyway let's start yeah right I'm excited. Okay. so we've got five uh five that we want to go through today and and uh, yeah say so given some kind of fast facts some interesting backstories hopefully to it the first one is entitled the migrant mother um so this is by dorothea lang in 1936 so again i you know if you if you know the title of these uh, you'll hopefully kind of know what we're talking about but um kind of yeah giving you a bit of information about this this is um it was a kind of a portrait or actually a series of photographs that were taken mm -hmm. in the middle of america's kind of great depression and and the portrait of uh, that Dorothea Lang took was of a lady called Florence Owens Thompson, um, and then she had her children with her as well. And it, it's supposedly kind of uh, an indictment upon the hyperinflation and the lack of employment that American people were suffering in the 1930s. And um, I think you know if you've actually look at the photograph, I don't know if you've got it in front of you, but yeah. um, this lady was 32 years old. Yeah. She looks she nowhere looks near. Older, it. Bless her. <laughs> she could be closer to double it, and, and you know, and yeah. that I, I think that's probably one of the things that was quite striking. Once you know the backstory to it, um, of how pained you know that I'm I'm older than that, and I'd like to think I don't necessarily look kind of <laughs> as worn as uh, as Florence does in this photograph. But that that's kind of what the situation had, had thrust upon her. Really, she had how many children did she have? I think she had like Ooh. seven, seven kids or something like that. Maybe I don't know. Maybe I'm saying wrong. I think, yeah, I think it was like seven children that she had. Um, and actually in the photograph itself, she's holding one kind of cradled in her arms and the other two are like leaning on her shoulder, but looking away. Um, so it's really just revealing her one face, but um I think it's actually kind of a part of a series of images. Like I said, it wasn't just that one yeah. photograph that was taken. Was it, there was, was there a few? Yeah, I mean, she did take uh, other workers there as well because um, Florence Thompson was in a kind of key tickets camp it was. And I yeah. think she actually um, sold her tyres off her car wow. um, to, to quick get money to um, to work because the, um, the peas had all frozen. Oh, wow. Um, so, yeah, so um, she was in a, a kind of refuge camp um, for other workers so yeah there was a lot of um, images that came out from this series and Lang was actually working for the government um, when she took it and she 
was paid for by the US government to go and take these images. Um, which actually, um, I've read that upon finding the images and seeing uh, the, the results, the government did send aid to these workers and sent them uh, a lot of food and things. So oh, that's good. That it, it, again, yeah, well, that's it. It shows the the power of photography that I think, again, we'll, we'll come to mention it, maybe something very similar again in another image um, where the image has had an impact to such a degree that it's yeah. it, it's changed things, really. And I know photography may just seem very kind of um, superficial, uh, depending upon where you see it these days. But back then, it was, you know, there wasn't as much of a medium like television and, and obviously no internet and things like that. So, you know, that was the, the one of the main forms of communication in a way, you know, to stick that on the front front of a, a newspaper, et cetera. Um, it would get people talking and certainly get governments motivated. And and you're right, you know, that um, Lang hadn't just taken uh, that, that photograph. She'd taken an, a number of different images of different people throughout the day. Um, and I think it got to the degree that she actually forgot to write down and record names. Um, and so this is why Florence Thompson, no one knew who she was when they looked at the photograph. Um, because there was, um, again, like the, the famous kind of um, picture of the Afghan girl by Steve McCurry, nobody yeah. knew who she was for years because just never got names got recorded, things just got kind of put down or incorrectly. It was just missed. So mm -hmm. she never got paid for it. It wasn't as if she was posing for a portrait session or anything like that, um, because Lang just took the pictures and then moved around and had to go. Um, so I believe even again, in retrospect, they've never actually received any royalties from it because the image, like you said, Lang was a government employee and therefore yeah. the photographs were owned then by the government and went into the public domain. So, you know, she wasn't financially benefiting from it, though, even though she did get, you know, hopefully some aid out the back end of it, really. But the very what, interesting what story. What I found really interesting about this, uh, and again, the same with um, Afghan Girl, which we'll come to later on, um, is that you don't think twice about if you, I mean, I guess it's different if you went somewhere with a purpose, but you know, how many travel photos do you snap away or street photography? And you never stop and ask these people a name. And, yeah. you know, imagine if that image blew up and you found out that that was you imagine if there's an image of you somewhere that a photographer had taken that you didn't know even existed um, I, I, it's something that you think shocking but you wouldn't think twice about it really no you wouldn't and i'm there is also um online again we'll put a link to our blog and through that you can actually get a link to seeing the rest of the photographs that she's taken of lang and the family and i think it gives you a better understanding of the surroundings that she's in because i'm looking at the other ones and then she sat breastfeeding the children um and they're literally in you know i can't even call it a tent because it's like an open fronted mm. tent um and mm. everything looks so dilapidated it really does not scream kind of 1930s america though they were going through a huge depression um this looks like more of a war zone than than anything mm. else that's the best way i can describe it so i, I would certainly say for for anybody that, that's got um web access just kind of have a look at those as well and i think it it fills out the story a little bit more to, to what actually want, what went on really. But yeah, yeah. but that's very, very interesting indeed. Mm -hmm. So, so moving from story one, what have we got in the second one? I think personally, this is one of my favorites in, in Me terms too, of, but you wouldn't have it on your wall. Would you? No, no. I, and I wouldn't say favorite is like, Oh my God, it's amazing. It's amazing photographically, but as we'll get to the story, yes, yeah. it's not the story so much. Is amazing, I think. Yeah, indeed. Well, I'll, I'll let you, I'll let you kind of lead this one then back. Yes, I mean, I've actually written um, part of my degree piece on this as well. Oh, wow. um, I did not Because know. I think it's this and Napalm Girl is another one that I've written. Oh, yes. As well. um, but this is The Vulture and the Little Girl by Kevin Carter. Um, and it's, if you've seen this image, it's heartbreaking. It's, it is so motivating and so cap captivating the, the way he's captured it. Um, and it's so sad. Uh, and it really shows that the famine in, in Saddam at this time, it's 1993, he'd captured it. Um, and it shows a young child who was actually making her own way. I can't remember if it was a girl or a boy. I think it I think was a little a girl. girl, yeah. I think I think. It's a girl. Uh, oh, it's in the title, The Vulture and the Little Girl. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it but it is, it, is, it is hard to say. I, I, I think they, yeah. they maybe didn't know at the time either. And I think it was only something that came out afterwards um, because it was literally, a, like you said, a, a shot and then he <laughs> went. Yeah, so and she was actually, I've read that she was actually making her own way to a, um, a relief centre. And um, if it, she's tiny, she must have been under two years old. Mm. 
um, and a vulture kind of stopped and was watching her, um, which is what Kevin's captured. And I've also read that the, the team, because again, was Kevin working for the government or something similar? Along he was on a project, yeah, yeah, with a guy called uh, Zhao Silva. Um, but yeah, he was on assignment. Yes. Um, and he'd been advised not to touch anyone uh, in case of the spread of disease. Um, but so he, although we did go on to chase the vulture away, it didn't help the little girl in any mm. sense in terms of picking her up and moving her uh, and helping her along her way, um, which is quite sad, really. And it makes me think, especially the way the world is at the moment with um, coronavirus, how much the fear for disease and infection mm. can actually Im impact people. So yeah, you, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm just sat there, kind of just staring at the photograph because it is, it's so harrowing. And I've read kind of separate accounts of people saying it's, it wasn't as bleak as it may sound. But the argument that they had is that the actual wider shot. I don't know if this was cropped necessarily, but at least the wider surroundings, that medical center that she was going to was was literally kind of, you know, just to the to the right of the image, really. And I think there's maybe some people there. But regardless of, you know, the wider context, I think that's where photography is really good. That OK, it may have cut out some elements of what's surrounding it, but you can't include everything in within the photograph anyway. Yeah. And plus framing it correctly framed a situation and, and emphasized it more and, and obviously kind of gave help um to, to these people because i think again like we talked about with the image of, of dorothea lang that um it actually kind of had a, a large effect upon the wider community and it did help uh the sudanese people get the aid or at least governments talking more about it um but it had quite an effect on the photographer himself didn't it yeah it did yeah so um after he won uh as a I can't pronounce it. Pulitzer. Pul Pulitzer. Oh, Pulitzer. Pul Pulitzer. I don't <laughs> Pulitzer. Know which way you pronounce it. <laughs> um, Kevin Carter did actually commit suicide, um, which, which is tough, you know. And I imagine he got a lot of grief from this image. A lot of um, people who didn't understand uh, where it was coming from. But the little girl did actually go on to live to 14. Mm. Um, although she did still die from famine. Um, so I, I think the image had had an impact, but not necessarily as, as strong as, as we'd have hoped, unfortunately. Indeed, yeah, with the photograph being taken in 1993, there was supposedly a report from her father that the little girl that I believe was named Kong Nyong, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but that's that's what we've got Better from our I details. <laughs> Kong Nyong, uh, she passed away in 2007. So. She still kind of went on to live um, for, for quite a considerable time, considering the photograph. You think she, she may not last months or weeks, uh, given the state that she's in. But as you say, uh, Kevin Carter didn't even last that long. I think it was um, early 1994 um, yeah. he, that he killed himself. And supposedly, obviously, you never necessarily to know the, all the reasons why, but it was partly led by his guilt um, that he couldn't help the girl anymore because, as you said, he literally was told not to take, uh, not to touch anybody or touch anything. Um, and he took the photographs, and him and Zhao Silva were literally due to head off to the airport, which was quite nearby, to catch a flight to go somewhere. So he literally didn't even stop to see what happened potentially afterwards. Um, and it was that guilt kind of that had ridden him, you know, for, for long periods of time afterwards, because obviously his image became so well known. Um, it really had obviously an, a massive an effect. So it, it, it does show that photographers and the, the subjects and their contents, they're, they're emotionally entwined to a massive degree. Yeah. And something that always kind of springs to mind with this image is that, you know, it, the image had a massive impact on the world and it's still very famous. Um, and as you say, it, it did bring a lot of relief back to Sudan. Yeah. Um, and it, one thing that I think people struggled to understand was that his first instinct was to take the photo and not to chase away the, the vulture, um, which is a difficult situation, I think, because as a human being, you want to save another human being, but then as a photographer and a documenter, you want to capture it and, and do yeah. the good that comes from that as well. Yeah, um, that's it. So it's a, it's a tough situation to be in, I think. Yeah, you do sit and maybe think, had he chased the vulture away and helped uh, Kong, what help, you know, what what stimulus would there have been? 
to help these people um you know and yeah. it's it's different from manufacturing the situation and the scene and setting it all up to to make it look really really bad but obviously that just occurred but i think yeah his his urge to help though he may have not been able to physically go and help them you know was to maybe help them through it through his photography and oh my god it, yeah. it did help them i mean uh, you know as much as given some sort of aid can and i know even that issue still continues now but you know, at least it, it did some good at that time anyway, really. But um, yeah. but yeah, indeed. So let's move on before we all end up in tears. Um, and well, we'll go actually to the, the Afghan girl. We did say we would talk about that one. Um, so yeah. I'll kick off with that. So um, this, I, I'm sure in photography circles, not to say everybody should know this, but it's pretty iconic. I think it's probably one of the most memorable uh, and recognizable shots that we'll talk about. Um, so this is the Afghan girl by Steve McCurry in 1984. Um, so yeah, again, if you're not familiar with this and then, then please check it out. And, uh, even if you just type into Google Afghan girl, I'm sure you'll get the right photograph, but, um, so basically Stephen Curry had gone on assignment, uh, covering the war, I believe in, um, Afghanistan, it was about the Soviet, Soviet Union's occupation of Afghan in, in 1984 and had come across this girl, Shabat Gula, um, in a Pakistani refugee camp. Um, and I believe she was kind of in school at the time. They, they were actually kind of having some sort of lessons. I, I remember kind of reading a little bit more about this separately. Um, but loads of people have had kind of like different takes upon the image and, and different kind of um, thoughts about it. But some people cite it, and, and this is kind of a quote of the Mona Lisa of the third world, which is kind of quite a, quite a title to bestow on a, a photograph, really. But some say it's like the depiction of like an oppression on society. But it's it's those eyes um, that are absolutely haunting and and so kind of oh, what's the word uh, encapsulating, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, you you feel so as if she's staring right at you. Yeah, you know, it, it has a really really striking look. Um, mm. It's, like it, the, it's quite a shocking look as well, isn't it? It is. It's it, it, how clear the whites are around her eyes, comparison to her darker skin. And then she's kind of hooded as well. And that kind of outfits that darker red. They, they are so piercing. And it's one thing we always say in portraiture is like, get the eyes right uh, and the rest mm -hmm. will follow. And, and literally, he could do no wrong. She has most incredible eyes. Um, but again, there was a similar situation that kind of fell out of this image that it did with, with Dorothy Lang's migrant mother that um, no one kind of was able to kind of accurately kind of get the information from her about who she was. So she wasn't known for years, was she? No, it wasn't um, until 2002. Yeah. Uh, and she right. was actually in her 30s um, and they used Irish, that's hard to say, Iris <laughs> recognition technology. <laughs> That's yeah. a tongue twister. Um, <laughs> and she actually remembered, but uh, she was interviewed saying that looking at the image made her feel sad. Um, and it, again, it goes back to the other images that we've spoken about. Is that that little bit of, of a sacrifice almost from that one that one girl mm. who was then brought on a, a much bigger impact into the world. Um, I don't think she's overly pleased with, with the image. No, I, it's, yeah, it was one of those I've, I've been, I've read, um, I've read, I've watched a couple of videos about people who have also kind of, you know, uh, discussed the image, et cetera, probably to a, a greater degree than ourselves. And they've, they, um, I think they, there was like a, I don't know if it was like an anniversary review of the photograph, but someone went back certainly and, and did like an interview with Shaba um, to kind of get her thoughts on it. And yeah, she wasn't, I'll say she wasn't blown away by it. I think she's very appreciative of what it had done. But at the time, it, it, I say she was a child, you know, I, mm -hmm. I don't know how old she was exactly, but um, it just didn't strike her as something kind of very, you know, glamorous or anything like that at all. Obviously, she's in a refugee camp. It's not kind of a most glamorous situation to be in. Um, so nobody yeah. thought it was going to be, you know, important or iconic or anything like that. Um, though she could remember it, but yeah, otherwise it didn't. It, it didn't factor at the time as being like a big thing in her life. She was there. I think as I say, I think she was like in a school situation. Um, and McCurry had come in. I don't know if he did a few of the kind of uh, shots of like the other children and group shots, um, but obviously this one in particular uh, kind of stood out. And again, retrospectively, it was something that kind of caught so many people's attention at the time. But um, but yeah, so 
another good one, another good set of fast facts there. And yeah, I think um, following on um, from publishing the image that National Geographic actually set up um, a charity for Afghanistan girls and sent them, I think it was around about a million dollars in the end they sent them across. Oh, really? So again, it, it, did, it did bring some, some good facts into the community. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, it's always nice to know, again, like we've talked out with, with a few of these um, photographs that they've always had some sort of impact then afterwards, really. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm just kind of having a brief look now on Wikipedia about kind of where she's up to <laughs> now in life, because it's in, 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 interesting to kind of know um, the, what, the, what she kind what of gone on to, to do. Yeah, you know, where her <laughs> life went on, which, you know, did, did she get out of the refugee camp and that kind of what went on to it, really? So, um, so yeah, there's, there's, kind of, there's kind of quite a few different things. There's, um, she's appeared in on like, yeah, the covers of like National Geographic. She's been in documentaries, you know, just about kind of her image. And like you said, the National Geographic set up the Afghan Girls Fund um, to help kind of educate Afghan girls and young women. So yeah, it's fantastic that again, just one photograph had inspired now, you know, hopefully, you know, education for, for children kind of going through such a similar situation. So it, it, it's absolutely fantastic that again, one image has had so much impact again. Um, yeah, definitely. Lovely. Right. So we'll go from, you know, there's kind of the, the photo do, uh, journalists or photo, photo documentaries, whatever you want to call them, to something a little bit more Hollywood. Um, and Marilyn Monroe is on our next one. Have you, you've, you've, you're kind of familiar with this picture, aren't you? Yeah, I think everyone knows this picture with her, um, with her flying skirt, um, which is, I think, is, it's one of the most iconic Marilyn Monroe moments of her entire life. Um, and it's funny because the, the moment looks candid, but it was actually completely scripted. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and she was really good friends with the photographer. And I think she actually gave him a lift to work that day. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a strange um, one it is. They, they were the best friends, weren't they? I would say best yeah. friends. They were, they were very good friends. It was taken by uh, Sam Shaw in 1954, this was. Yeah, which is great. And it's great that they've both helped each other's... Um, careers in that sense and um, uh, it was his kind of idea that he wanted to show her relaxed personality and how kind of fun she was um so I think it was leaving a, a movie set that they they noticed the air vent and I think he got the inspiration from a film I can't remember to be honest yeah I think um, you're right I think he did get the inspiration from somewhere else but then asked her to kind of stage this moment and he was just so happened to be in the prime spot to capture it um and I think there were other photographers around because it was a kind of paparazzi moment mm. um but it was completely staged by the, by the pair I think yeah. it's fantastic it and I is... think as well at, at that point in time it was very kind of uh racy and a bit la -de da <laughs> oh yeah yeah I mean it, this is what I've, I've written in our on our blog that it was, um, it was, yeah, as much as it may seem kind of, you know, tameish today, if you go back to the 50s, this was, you remember Kim Kardashian was on, uh, on the front cover of Paper Magazine with that kind of yeah. hilarious kind of champagne thing over there, and she's fully nude, and it went absolutely viral in seconds. This, you know, had the internet been around in 1954, this would have been front page news because um, Munro, as you said, has stood over this, I think it was like a grate and there was like an underground train passing and it's blowing up like a plume of smoke, lifted her dress and she's got like a kind of shorts on or such, it may just been an underwear, but the fact that you can see her legs so high up, um, people are just like, oh my word, this is, this is probably too much. This is like, you know, you can't even show this before nine o'clock watershed. Um, and she's turned towards the camera because she knew where Sam Spade was, uh, sorry, Sam Shaw was. I keep saying Sam Spade, but because that's actually her nickname for him. And that supposedly yeah. is what she's meant to be shooting. She's like, hey, Sam Spade. That's my Marilyn Monroe accent, as you can tell. Um, <laughs> uh, but that's her like a pet name for him. Um, and so, yeah, she's looked directly towards him, but it was an image that was kind of quite iconic. I think again, more so after her death because mm. she looked so glamorous, so Hollywood, yet she was really struggling um, with depression and anxiety. Mm. Um, there's a massive contrast between what was seen on screen and, and what was not seen necessarily, but I suppose that's true. Well, I imagine it's true anyway, of many kind of, um, you know, big actors, you know, as, as much as they may seem, they've got it all together. They, they quite possibly haven't. 
completely agree. I mean, um, Robin Williams springs to mind as someone who yeah. was always playing a comedic role, but um, in reality, that was very far from the truth. Um, and I think this image does really well to show that fun side of Marilyn Monroe. Uh, and I think as well, it, it's lovely to have that memory of her that although she was suffering at the time, um, that memory of that, even if it was only a 10 second laughter, you mm. know, it, it was between friends and it was generic. And I think that's lovely. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't a moment for you know, for other photographers to kind of get involved, though there probably was other people there, like you said. You can actually even see one in the background. There's, there's another fella kind of crouched down with a camera kind of shooting from the back. From the back. Um, but, yeah, she turned to him specifically. She knew where he was and, and shouted for him. So, yeah, it was nice that they just had that that friendship moment, though it, it blew up into something else. But, um, but, right, so should we move on to our last image then? Um, I'm going to do my absolute best in terms of pronouncing this. <laughs> I've been <laughs> dreading this one. All right. <laughs> this is my best, what is it? Cuban, Spanish? Cuban, but, yeah. gu- gu- uh, Guilherio, uh, Guilherio Heroico. Either way, it's by Brilliant. Alberto Alberto Cordo, 1960. Uh, and it basically translates as heroic guerrilla fighter. Uh, and this is the portrait of Che Guevara. This you, if you've not seen the photograph, I can guarantee you've probably almost seen it on a poster or a t-shirt yeah. or a cup. It has got reproduced so many times. It's as popular as like a Windows wallpaper or something like that you've seen <laughs> on your computer. And you see it everywhere you go because it it's basically become like the staple kind of iconic piece for uh, or symbol for for freedom or repression or, or you know, basically Rebellion. kind of being that. Yeah, that's it. The poster boy of Cuba, I think they had him called for a, a long time. And this say was back in like 1960. Uh, and even kind of Cor- uh, Albert O'Corda's kind of recalling of it is that it was just a chance opportunity. Like even to quote, it's like, this photograph is not the product of knowledge or technique. It was really just pure luck and coincidence, basically. Because mm-hmm. um, I think Guevara at the time, who wasn't necessarily kind of, you know, a, a big and iconic figure as he, as he kind of maybe ret- retrospectively is now, he was at a funeral, um, I think in, in Havana in Cuba, um, like a memorial service and he basically just kind of stepped a little bit forwards kind of over this platform uh, and then kind of caught her from the kind of crowds kind of seeing because he was a little bit lower down and he, and he just kind of took this image and it was kind of quite closely cropped in but it's that I think it's that kind of rugged looks you know the the kind of the part beard mustache the thick eyebrows and the kind of crazy hair um but I think it's like that kind of it's like a like a military beret doesn't it he's wearing yeah with the star in the middle yeah, that's it. So it's just, again, this little symbols of that kind of defiant face, the little catch light in the eyes, which makes all the difference. And, and that slightly furrowed brow, it, it, it basically became like a, a symbol for freedom in a way for mm-hmm. co- people or countries that were kind of felt as they were a bit oppressed, really. So it there wasn't kind of that much behind it in terms of like a, a massive backstory. It wasn't set up. It was just proven um, that it was just quickly a, a chance shot and even the photographer mm-hmm. himself said it was pure luck and you know somebody else could have rolled up and taken a very similar photograph that day whereas a few of the other ones have maybe been like we looked at with Monroe's it was a bit more staged um but this was just kind of being in the right place in the right time and that's something we say a lot isn't it it is yeah and I think um again this was part of a series of images so Alberto Corda was I think again employed by the government or uh, some sort of news, um, some sort of news uh, sub <laughs> <laughs> Um, You know what I mean. So there was actually other images within the the funeral that um, were more sought after at the time, and yeah. it wasn't until um, where I actually died. Um, having led a guerrilla guerrilla warfare um, mission, um, he was killed in combat. And then this image came to light, and then uh, that's where it's come from. Um, guerrilla warfare is generally smaller um, coalitions taken up against the government or yeah. um, larger organisations with kind of almost dirty tactics in a way. Um, yeah, but but sneaky. Um, so the image was kind of disregarded until he died, which is quite interesting, I think. Indeed, yeah. I'm, I'm actually just looking at the, basically like the contact sheet, uh, Corder's role of film as to what he shot that day. 
Um, and the, the image of Che Guevara is one of two. Um, mm. So the one that we actually see is cropped in. It's a little bit wider and it has actually got part of a man's face on the left hand side and a bit of a tree on the left. So I can see why he's cropped it to go in a bit tighter because then the second shot he's got is that someone was just behind his shoulder. So it would have been really, really tricky to kind of remove that. So, yeah, just looking out of this kind of contact sheet of different shots he's got, it's basically two images, pretty much only one that was workable or usable to kind of cut down and then the other ones um again i've just got other people in so it, it's literally just two images out of everything that he's shot and he's got one of them that has became so iconic and for anybody that's uh, interested in the details and the stats that he um, Corda was shooting on a leica m2 with a 90 mil lens uh, and using kodak X, uh, plus x uh pan film so yeah, if anyone's interested in that there you go something for the uh the technical people amongst us all that quite like it um but yeah there we go it was another nice little story to look at it um it but was, that's, yeah. that's fantastic so that's that's kind of five of our uh iconic portraits that we wanted to have a little talk about and give some fast facts for people that don't know them previously and hopefully you found that quite interesting and i think we've got like another one lined up to do haven't we at some point to look at some more yeah that'll be fun yeah indeed but if anyone that's listening if, if you've got kind of any other stories to add to the portraits that we've talked about um or other iconic images you know photographs that you want us to chat about and investigate a little bit further or insights you've got get in touch with us by all means you can find us on all the normal mm -hmm. social medias uh, and you can email us at tutor at iphotographycourse.com um, but yeah, I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, make sure you hit follow, subscribe, whatever you are, whether you're watching this on YouTube or listening to it on your podcast. Um, again, thank you very much, Rebecca, for joining us. And uh, we'll be able to do another episode in the future. So in the meantime, thanks for listening and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Goodbye.